Okay, we are live. Uh, good morning in Nepal. Okay. Good evening from here in New York. Uh -huh. um, it's about 8.30, 7.30 in the morning there, 8.40 here. Um, this is Professor Dean Hammond. He is a professor of writing and rhetoric at uh, Stony Brook University, part of the State University of New York. Uh, professor Hammond has been teaching writing, uh, English studies, um, yeah, and in, in those in these two fields in the last 30, 40 years. 40 years. <laughs> uh, right now, we teach together at the same university. He used to be the director of the writing program, um, and now he has handed it over to another colleague, and he, he is uh, teaching this semester uh, this year. So I'm really, really, really honored to present him as the uh, discussion, uh, discussion presenter, uh, leader of this conversation today. Uh, I will let him describe what he wants to dis discuss. And I um, would like to encourage you to ask questions to make the session productive. Okay, here is Professor Hammond. Ah. Well, hello. How many, how many of you are there? Maybe five or six or seven? Oh, by the way, could you please introduce yourself because I forgot to say that. Okay, so it's me, Edu uh -huh. I'm coordinating this, this Wake Up webinar. I'm coordinating uh, since uh, a long time with uh, Dr. Sam Sharma. Good. Uh, here we, we are nine participants and we're doing it today because of some problem, uh, two participants are sick. Okay. That's why they could not be here and other participants are here participating with you today. And we are really thankful with Dr. Sharma and with you because we can bring you in Surkhet from this Skype or from this uh, uh, year. That's why I would like to thank you very much and welcome to this session and our friends are introducing with you. <laughs> Yeah. Hello, Namaste. Good morning, Thank you. Nepal and Kapri. I've been teaching English at this university for the last Can you be a little years. louder? We don't hear you that much. Let me see if I can increase the volume. Once again? Yeah. Uh, hello, good morning. From Nepal. I'm Ramesh Khatri. I have been teaching at this university for the last uh, four years. Uh -huh. uh, at present, I'm working as a, as a head of English education at this university. Oh, good. So you're not a science educator necessarily, huh? Some of them are. Uh-huh. Good. Uh, good morning from Nepal. I am Resham Bista. Uh, I am faculty member of English department. department. Uh, I teach their English literature, Nepal literature too, in different literary journal and writing uh -huh. too, and philosophy. Thank you. Excellent. Should I ask questions now? <laughs> Finished, huh? Namaste, sir. It's me, Dharmaraj Kogan. Uh, I am the faculty member of uh, science, and I am teaching uh, physics for, I think, six years in the university. Oh, good. Let me, can I tell you a story of, of my favorite physics teacher? <laughs> We, we were in a large lecture room uh -huh. where the lecturer is in the bottom of the room and then the students you know are in a, in a raised set of seats up at the, uh, in the back of the room uh -huh. and the professor was trying to teach about friction uh -huh. and so he hung a bowling ball from the ceiling uh -huh. and he put it at the level of his nose and he went and stood against the wall <laughs> and, he, and he brought the bowling ball right next to his nose and then he let the ball swing all the way across the room and then come back and it stopped an inch short of his nose. And so he said he, he believes in friction and so he wasn't worried about getting hurt by the ball. <laughs> that's, that's, the, that's the confidence of a physics. Exactly, exactly. It was I'm one so of the best and present demonstrations I ever saw in my life. <laughs> <laughs> okay, go on. Namaste and good morning from Nepal. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I am a fellow from the School of Engineering. I have been teaching here since uh, 10 months. Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you. He's an engineer, professor. An engineer. Uh, uh, good morning. Good morning. Uh, I'm Santos Vandari. Uh -huh. uh, I'm Santos Vandari. I am uh, a faculty member of uh, uh, management department. I've been teaching business English for almost oh, four years. Okay. I did not know that. I thought it was just, uh, a, just a management teacher. Oh, good. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, sir. <laughs> So is that the whole group? Yes. 
So my, my first question is whether you got a chance to read what Sam sent, sent you. Uh, uh, he said something about facts, inferences, and a thesis. Uh, a chapter of, of a textbook. Did, did you get a chance to read that or not? I'm just curious. Can you hear me? Yes, uh, inference provided us inference factor. Well, let me let me begin. Let me begin without uh, assuming. Okay. Did Did you read the uh, chapter that I sent you by email? <laughs> yes, sir. We we have uh, studied a uh, little, uh, not uh, surfacely. Uh, that uh, I mean, oh, yeah. uh, uh, we have seen that uh, note. Right. Okay. Yeah, just, okay. just wanted to know if okay. I'm going to review now or they've already looked at it. Right. Um, I, I, what I would like us to talk about today is um, facts and inferences uh, because I think they're so fundamental to all of it, education. And I first got this idea when I was in my 20s, and my wife was a chemist. And I was uh, a writing teacher. And um, as, as I was thinking about the importance of inferences and, and facts, I would talk to her about it. And she would say, we do this exactly the same way in chemistry. Um, that we have to, you know, by experimenting, we decide what are the important facts, the, the, the ones that help us to understand what we're looking for. And, um, and then we have to go, draw good, good inferences in order to uh, uh, be good chemists. And then when we write up our results, the combination of the facts and the inferences is what persuades somebody that we're a sensible chemist. Um, so at that time, I was trying to get tenure at the University of Maryland, and I decided to write a textbook that would focus on facts and inferences. Um, and I get the sense that when, when students are thinking about writing, they have no idea what should make up the substance of writing. They know that grammar is important somehow, or they're afraid that grammar is important. And they um, sort of know the tone of voice is important. Um, and they know that they should be saying something that sounds profound or sounds intelligent. But they don't really know what the building blocks are of, of what they're writing. And so I find it helps enormously to get them to uh, realize that, that Basically, facts and inferences constitute everything that they write. Um, and then it's, I think, important for them to distinguish between facts and inferences because inferences are often prejudices, for example. Um, if if uh, you say uh, women are um, not strong enough to survive in the workplace, um, that's not a fact but it's an inference that a lot of people have gotten used to and they think of it as a fact. Uh, and, they, and if they don't really understand that there's importance, if it is important to distinguish between facts and inferences. So I have one exercise that I use that I hope will work via uh, Skype um, because uh, you may have a hard time seeing exactly what I'm putting in front of you. But what I like to do is to empty my pockets. I think you, if you read the chapter, you've, you've uh, at least heard a little bit about that. And, and then have you all, or you know, if, if it was another group, I would have the students do the same thing. Have you all write down what you see in my pockets? Because everything in my pockets is a fact. It's a fact that those things are in my pockets. And then after that, based on those facts, I would like you to try to draw inferences about me. And since I'm here to answer questions, I can tell you whether those inferences are accurate or not. In some cases, I don't know myself probably as well as you might know me based on the facts that I have in my pockets. So do you think we could manage doing that? If, I think so. Especially if, especially if, if, if I... Uh, showed it here in front of the camera, and I right. can also okay. switch it to uh, the other view, which you can see okay. yourself. Uh, good. I like, see, I like seeing the people I'm talking to. But... Um, <laughs> <laughs> I can always do this. Good. I, what I'm going to do that I don't usually do is describe a little bit in more detail what is in my pocket so you don't just have to look and see. Um, so do you all have a, a piece of paper that you can write on? 
You do. Good. Okay. So that will be essential to the, to this exercise. And what I'm very interested in is I've never done this cross culturally before. So I'm very interested in in how you will interpret some of the things in my pockets because it might be very different in Nepal than it would be in the United States. Okay. So in my right front pocket of my um, slacks, I have a handkerchief that is partially used. Okay. That's that's a let me show it once more. That's an embarrassing start. <laughs> so that was in the right pocket. Okay. Remember that. Okay. Also in my right front pocket, I have a set of keys, two keys on the key ring. And I don't know if you can see the kind of keys they are. Can you can you see this key? Can you see the letter, the, the brand, the imprint? No, I wouldn't key? see that. But just the, even the shape of the key might give you some clues. Okay. Okay. Now, in my left front pocket, I've, tr I've tried not to add anything to my pockets today, so it, this is just what's normally in my pockets. Here's is a handkerchief that's unused. Okay. Here is, here is a... Um, um, you might have added that since... since exactly. Since you arrived here. That's right. Here, here is a napkin with a little yellow stain on it. Remember, this yellow stain looks like turmeric. <laughs> okay. Besa. Oh, also in this pocket, I have a cell phone that looks like this, if you can see it. Yeah, my okay. <laughs> That's all in that pocket. In my left back pocket, I have another handkerchief, unused. <laughs> okay, good. I'm glad you're laughing. Okay. In my, you go to your right back. In, in my right back pocket, I have a wallet. So this will take a while, because there are quite a few things in the wallet. Um, I have a credit card. It's a Visa card, and it's from Southwest Airlines. Airlines. Okay. In my, uh, also, I have a credit card that is also from uh, another Visa card from Southwest Airlines. How are they different? Uh, it's hard to say, but I can tell you one has a microchip and one doesn't. Okay. I have a card that's a, a Visa card from Amazon.com. Amazon. Amazon. See, and it doesn't really matter whether you know these things or not. Um, in fact, that will illustrate the point even better. Then I have a, ca a card that says stop and shop on it. Okay. All you have to do at this point is write down what you see. But you can also decide what's important. If you don't think it's important, then don't write it down. And this is a pharmacy card. It's called an extra care card. Okay. A Bank of America Visa card. Okay. Then I have a triple A card, and I don't want to tell you what that means. You might, you might it's know. It's called AAA card. AAA. You might know. But you might not. You might not. Okay. Then I have a card that says, uh, let's see, the Empire Plan. Health insurance card. Yes, it says New York State Health Insurance Program. Okay. Then I have a Stony Brook blood donor card. Blood donor. And my blood type is my blood type is O positive. Wow. <laughs> okay. And it says next donation date is six one o nine. September 9. September 09. Then I have a uh, Delta Dental card. I won't tell you what that means. But it's a card that comes from uh, the union that we belong to. From the teacher's union. The Delta Dental. Okay. Okay. Maybe not. Okay, then I have a little piece of paper that says uh, 34 20 38. 
24, 30, no, 34, 20, 38. We can show this. Can you? Okay. Look at this. Okay. Now I, I have a little piece of paper that has five names on it, and each has a nine-digit number next to it. It's getting very faded, I have to say. Okay, and the, and the people on it are Mom, Jean, Kathy, Liz, and Mike. Mom, Jean, Kathy, Liz, and Mike. And then I have a card. It's an insurance card, and it's from USAA. Again, I don't want to tell you what that means. You might know. Probably not. Probably not. And it says, member since 1970. Then I have two business cards for a Stony Brook University that say my name, Gene Hammond, on them. Then I have a small piece of paper here that says, law-abiding citizen, Jamie Foxx and Gerard Butler. And then it says, salt, Angelina Jolie. Wow. <laughs> okay. Then I have, you said what? Uh, here's a piece of paper that's falling apart here that says msweeneyhammond at gmail.com, lizshammond at gmail.com, and ksweeneyhammond at murray.org. Okay. Then I have two $20 bills and two $5 bills and about six $1 bills. Okay. Then I have um, several small pieces of paper. This says Jeline and Dave and a phone number, my cell and a phone number, work numbers with three numbers and phone numbers, Katie and a phone number, and another card says Bank of America and a um, password, USAA and a password, Chase credit card and a password, Vanguard and a password. Uh, Beams Auto Repair and a phone number. And the names of the three people who work there, Mike, Atley, and Michael. Uh, messages and a phone number. Metal Mirror and a phone number. Marky Cell Number and a phone number. Um, ISBN My Book and an ISBN number, which is 12 numbers, I guess. Uh, updates on the laptop, a password. Elite Auto, Richie, and a phone number. Kathy's Wireless, and a code. Google Gmail, and some passwords. Long Island Power, and a password. Uh, the Water Company, and a password. Yale University, and a password. Southwest Rapid Rewards and a password. Airtran and a password. Expedia and a password. United Airlines and a password. Okay, I'm gonna skip a few things so that we can get to the discussion. Now in my shirt pocket, I have a few things. Here's a, a large piece of paper folded up that has a diagram on it with X's and lines. And one of the things on there is computer outlet, question mark. One of the things on there is a new wire and a question mark. And then there's a box that says hole in the attic. <laughs> hole in the attic. Okay. <laughs> and I have three, three blank pieces of paper. 
Actually, they're not blank. They're blank on one side, and there's scrap paper on the other side. Okay. And then I have a piece of paper that says, Camille, sell, and a phone number. And then I have a piece of paper that says, lunch with Linda, and two phone numbers. And then I have a sheet of paper that says, Rudyard Kipling, if, Blake, London, pound, wheelbarrow poem. Then I have a piece of paper that says, Dina, confirm, account number 229480, programming, writing, and rhetoric. I have a piece of paper that says, Sebastian's ablation. A B L A T I O N. I have a piece of paper that says on it, Dr. No, the fugitive kind, from Russia with love, the other woman, entrapment, the sand pebbles, empire of the sun, hunger games, heading south, and a couple of others. Then I have a piece of paper that says, Kirkle 543, 550, and 557, Fantastic Symphonies. Then I have a check to Jolene May for $500. Just fold it up. And then I have about 20 sheets of paper. I'll only tell you what's on one. But it's on one of them it says, Up and Under. Keep away, jump stops, 360 degree pivot, hesitation dribble. Then I have a sheet of paper that says, way to Russia. <laughs> then I have a paper that says, ferry, Stockholm to St. Petersburg versus via Tallinn, Estonia. Helsinki to St. Petersburg by train. Fly Moscow to Kathmandu, $480. Did you hear that? You hear that? I want to make sure. <laughs> Fly Moscow to Kathmandu, $480. Keep that in mind. Turkish Airlines best. 18 hours, 3,000 miles. Tashkent to Urumqi. To Sari Ozak, to Shiming, to Lhasa, to Kathmandu, 284 pounds. <laughs> Train, Moscow, Bishkek, Bishkek, Tashkent, Samarkand. Uh, Tashkent to Kathmandu, by car, three days, $650. Through Lhasa and China, train. Tashkent to Samarkand, train, 215 miles. Moscow to Novosibirsk, two days. Need Uzbekistan visa. So you're looking at these pieces of paper that he showed. The size, if you look at it, it's like three inch by one and a half inch. He had a bunch of them in which he, the other side is actually scrap paper and the other one side is blank. He's written all of these words you heard about places and costs and things. Okay, and then the last one I'll tell you is uh, Jim Carney, all-purpose construction and a phone number. Okay, and then I have a pen and a pencil in my, in my shirt pocket. So I'm sure that's faster than you could write it down, but that but that's the way life is. The facts go past us faster than we can write them down. Right? <laughs> um, so here's the interesting part. I wonder if you could write down any inferences you would draw about me based on what you've seen in my in my pockets. You could take take two or three minutes to to write down any inferences you might have. Imagine yourself as scientists, or imagine yourselves as 
um, literary critics interpreting a text, you're, you're interpreting the text of what is in my pockets. Does it automatically trigger with whoever's speaking? That's great. alternates every 30 seconds or something like that. Yeah. Okay, I, I assume, you know, you could, you could do this longer, but I assume that you might have two or three things to say at least. Um, and what I'd like to do is to hear what you imagine. I hope you'll be bold and don't be afraid of offending me. Uh, <laughs> Uh, that will make the exercise more interesting and more honest. Um, and then, but I'll, I'll try to comment on the implications for teaching writing, whether it's teaching writing in, in scientific fields or teaching writing uh, outside of scientific fields. So would anybody be bold enough to, to draw an inference? Uh, yes. Uh, well, yeah, I have made some kind of inference about you. From the given... Uh, uh, all those things that has, uh, has been found in your pockets. I uh -huh. can make that Jean Hammond is a special type of person who does not give particular interest and in, uh, in technology. <laughs> <You're>, <laughs> no, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, uh, yes. A special let's, type. Of yeah, let's let's stop right there. Yeah. Um, uh -huh. I think you're correct that, that I don't have a special interest in technology. But it's just yeah, a and, <laughs> um, and uh, yes, but, we are very conscious right. about uh, traveling different places. Uh -huh. And when traveling, you keep record of everything about the prices, about uh, uh, all those type of uh, facilities, and uh, you know particular persons you meet in a kind of notes. You love making notes of everything, okay. and besides you. Frequently with the persons uh, in phone, and you keep particular record of that person's places, you know, and all those amenities. Uh, and could besides, you, uh, stop, could you stop right here because you've said so many interesting things already, or at least things that we can talk about? Uh, I want to stop and talk about them before I forget about them. Um, your first one was that I, I I don't have a particular interest in technology now. What I would like to say about that is I think in general that it's true, but I think it's important when students are, are uh, drawing inferences, and I don't mean you as a student, but in order to transfer this to when you teach, if you get them to draw inferences, um, how much people know or care about technology, you can't just say somebody's interested or not interested. There's a spectrum of where people stand on the spectrum. And ordinarily, if you are more interested in technology than I am, then you will say that I'm not very interested in technology. Um, and that's true of any other quality, whether it's organization or friendliness or, or anything else. Um, so if I, when I do this exercise with students, what I like to do is stop and comment on that, on that uh, possibility and just, just say, um, yes, for the most part, I'd say by most modern standards, I'm not that interested in technology. But also re re recall or keep in mind when you draw that inference that you are drawing it uh, across a spectrum. So what else you said? What, uh, I like to take notes. Um, yes. Uh, yes. That's, again, that's certainly true. And again, maybe more so than other people. Um, some, you, you might say I like to keep notes. 
no, not only do I take notes, but they stay with me for a while. Did you notice the oldest thing in my in my wallet? I just, yes, yes, a lot of piece of paper. Right. <laughs> we found a lot of piece of paper in your in your pockets. Exactly. And some of them are very wrinkled. If you were closer, you could see how wrinkled and, and starting to fall apart they are because they've been in my wallet too long and I should take them out. Um, but I don't know. I don't know what even I would say about myself or what inference that I would draw about myself about my desire to keep these things. Um, did anybody else draw an inference about my tendency to keep things? Uh, I have drawn some inferences from your uh, from your pockets. Right. Some things you took out from your pockets. Okay. And I have interviewed you as a professor at the university. You are a writer. Okay. Uh, you, you like visiting different places. Uh, you are a social person involved in different social activities. Uh, you uh, are quite updated with your colleagues and friends through through cell phone and emails. Uh -huh. That is my inferences about you. Excellent, excellent. Okay, again, I don't, uh, I'm not sure how true they all are, but they sound true to me. <laughs> uh, in terms of what I want to, uh, what, what I would like to be. Can I say something? Yeah. Among the two last speakers, the first speaker was a younger, I think, or at least he was taking the point of reference of a very young person. Uh -huh. And he made it sound like you are an older person using uh, more traditional technology of paper. Interesting. But the second speaker took a very different point of reference, and he actually took all of those things as reliable, taking notes, social person. Uh, aha, aha. So it's a point of reference that was different. Which, which makes an extremely important point as far as I'm concerned, and that, that is that we draw different inferences depending on our experience. Uh, and experience can make you a much better inference drawer. So for example, if you're teaching engineering to students and they don't know very much engineering and you show them a, an experiment, they will probably not draw a very good inference from that experiment. But if you show more experienced engineering students or more adult engineers the same experiment, because they have more experience with the techniques of engineering and the principles of engineering, they will draw better inferences. And one of the reasons that I like to teach students to think this way is that it values information. You know, the more information you have, the better inferences you can draw. So, and this is why we specialize in English literature or specialize in, in physics or specialize in engineering. Uh, we spend a lot of time with those subjects so that we can draw good inferences in that field. And uh, when, when naive people who don't know much about our fields try to draw inferences, they often uh, don't do what we think, at least, is a very good job. But they will base it on their experience. If they've read a book or if they see that, that um, bowling ball exper experiment that I, uh, or demonstration that I described earlier, um, maybe I don't know that much about physics, but I remember the important principle that friction will slow the bowling ball down by at least a small factor before it gets back to that professor's nose. Um, I got that inference <laughs> when the professor made that move. So, yeah, so a young person, I, I like Sam's point very much, a young person is looking at the world from in, in a different framework and is going to draw slightly different inferences. One of the things that I also I like to praise students for is, is to be original in their writing. Uh, I don't know whether you um, value that in, in the kind of courses that you teach, but I, I suspect that it's getting more and more valued as we go along. Um, and students are often afraid that they can't be original, that, that they're, they're overwhelmed by the information or the writing that other people have done, their textbooks or, or their professors. But um, if you give them a chance, they can draw inferences that are valuable as well. And, and um, uh, when they do that and do that with some success, uh, they start to get confidence and then they will you know, continue with physics or continue with engineering or continue with English literature if they feel like they're starting to be able to think about things in ways that maybe their professors haven't. Uh, so it's, an enc it's, in it's encouraging to students to see that. Um, let me take up something else about what I think both of you uh, so far who have commented on, on my traveling. I think you both assumed that I had already taken the trip that was described by the various cities that um, were 
that were in my notes uh, where I, in fact, I haven't taken that trip yet, or I hope to take that trip. Uh, so I don't know whether I'm right about your inference, but to me, it's a good example of, of the fact that you can be, make mistaken inferences, okay? And if you make a mistaken inference, as we often do in lab work or, or any other kind of scientific work or any, any other kind of work, what helps us um, draw a better inference or to fix that inference is to get more experience or to ask more questions. So if, for example, I allowed you to ask me questions as follow-up, you could probably draw better inferences than you're able to draw just by uh, see, seeing what's in my pockets. Uh, do the two of you have any comments or responses to what I've said so far? Uh, I have uh, made some inference. Uh, I think uh, beside uh, the previous colleagues have said, Good. I uh, ate uh, something and that is uh, you are interested to see movie because uh, in the scrap paper you have some uh, the name of some movie list uh, over there and also you you uh, you are interested to write books because there is a ISBN number of your book and <laughs> scrap paper right and, uh, I think uh, uh, that that's it. A big beside the previous colleague said, I uh, add these two points. Um, okay, two points uh, they're, about. They're both very interesting. Number one, not everybody knows what an ISBN number is, right? But you know what an ISBN number is, and so therefore you're in a position to to draw an inference about my writing books. If, if, uh, if you didn't know what an ISBN number was, you wouldn't know how to make that inference. So uh, again, it's a, uh, an illustration of how important information is to drawing inferences. Same, same really with the movie uh, list. I wasn't sure because uh, yeah. I don't know how many of these movies come to Nepal or, or how often you're interested in movies. But I thought maybe if I read off eight or nine movies that maybe um, some of them would, would ring a bell for you. And so I, I'm really impressed that you noticed that. Um, but it is true. I didn't put that in my pocket, you know, in order to do this exercise. I, I am interested in movies and I actually like to fall asleep to movies. So I, I watch movies 10 minutes at a time. <laughs> um, and then fall asleep and then watch 10 more minutes the next day, next night. But that's my, like my favorite end of the evening entertainment. Uh, so thank you, thank you for for your inferences. Uh, now you know what else is occurring to me as I listen to yours, is that with three different people we've had three different infer sets of inferences. Again, showing the originality of the way we we draw inferences. Yes. Uh, uh, again, based on our experience, but also based maybe sometimes on our values. I don't know if that has come out or might come out in some of the other inferences mm -hmm. that, that people have. Mm -hmm. Did can I can I add something to this? There are so many useful lessons in this activity for the classroom because, one, we want to uh, encourage our students to make inferences. Second, we want to value the originality of their thinking. And third, we want to make sure that they know they can make mistakes, that they should be courageous in making inferences because an education based on facts is not really doing service to our students. An education based on students making meaning Students making, starting with making inferences is what we want to move towards, right? I, I would just underline that by, or, or add to that, that it's important to have the facts as well because uh, when you have the facts underlining, you can draw better inferences, as I said before. Yeah, yeah. But ultimately, the goal is to have students drawing good inferences. Um, uh, was there anybody else in the room that, that wanted to say anything about inferences that they saw? Or inferences that they drew based on what they saw, excuse me. Uh, yes, from your information, we know that you talk about the travel package and the time, little information of the traveling, and you talk about the, you visited the different places. Uh -huh. But my friends is here, 
But you don't care about the accommodation of your travel. I don't care about the accommodation? Yeah, what happened? There are those travels. Interesting. <laughs> interesting. That is very interesting. I love that. I think that's a great insight. <laughs> and, and I think and, uh, it's a great insight because I don't care about accommodation at all. I, I, I sleep in the car, or I'll sleep on the train, or, or I'll sleep in a tent, uh, and you wouldn't notice that. I mean, how would you know that except by being a brilliant inference drawer? You know, uh, I like that. I thought about that <laughs> from what I saw, from what I read. So, tremendous, tremendous inference, I think. The one is missing, right? <laughs> exactly. That's, That's right. There. That is right, and I'm glad you said that because. Um, in science, but anywhere else too, what is not present is equally important with what is present, or at least very important, even if it's not quite as, as valuable as what is present. So, um, uh, whether it's in a book that you're studying or whether it's an experiment that you're looking at, what doesn't happen is very important. And it takes really more imagination to, um, to notice what's not there and to draw an inference about it. And that's where a lot of good scientific discoveries come from. Uh, anybody else? Right, right. <sighs> This time is not. not. It's okay. okay. Uh, go, go ahead. Okay. Go ahead, sir. It's. Oh. Sir. Who, who, who are you saying that to? Is someone talking? Oh. Oh. Mm -hmm. no. Okay. Uh -huh. What's up? What's up? Yes. Go, go. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I didn't quite understand what you said. But he said continue. Oh, okay. Well, uh, let, let Please me continue. Well, maybe there's. All right. Sorry. Sorry. Is someone going to talk on that side? Oh, no, 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 no. Oh, it's not on that round. Okay. Okay. Let me say a couple of things. Speaking of what's not there, there are a couple of things that you have not commented on that my students comment on consistently. One is they say that I'm not very security conscious because I have all these passwords in my wallet. Yeah, I was thinking. Okay, I don't, but I don't know what the habit is in, in your in your life. Yeah. Whether you have to be security conscious, or uh, where do you keep your passwords, or do you keep them in your head? Are you better memorizers than I am? I don't know. What do you do? How is my how is my <laughs> practice with passwords different from yours? Uh, we have to go to this kind of password in i think uh, in uh, uh, self uh, phone some there is some uh, uh, places where we have um, we can store that kind of password and also in uh, computer and also in the internet uh, google drive uh, is there and also other kinds of you know, thing we have uh, stored such kind of password not in the war some kind of uh, scrap paper or not in the, also we are not uh, saved uh, some kind of thing in the uh, in, in inside the wallet. I think uh, I, uh, I I have saved also all the things in the computer uh, in the especially in the internet uh, like Google Drive. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay. Good. Yours is not less safe, uh, not less, <laughs> not more secure. Uh, I think because like if one is, you, you, something is hacked. It's as likely as Professor Hammond losing his wallet, don't you think? <laughs> but we have a feeling. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, we, I think you're right. We each have to find our own way of feeling secure, and um, it will it will depend not just on the facts, but on, on emotionally what makes us feel secure. Can I say one thing? Uh huh. I think all of the colleagues talking until now did not pick on a lot of things that I was able to pick, because from a cultural perspective. Some of the things that you did not probably take notes or probably did not, did not make any sense, I could because I have lived here in this country for 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, I can't remember exactly now, but I was thinking, oh, you have a, a Navy um, 
Okay, uh, insurance, insurance card. Insurance yeah. card. Right. You probably didn't understand. That was a United States a Navy, a meaning Army insurance card, because he was in the Army many years ago. Uh, you probably didn't get that. I was looking at Amazon.com and thinking, wow, Gene, you are you know, ahead of the game here because a lot of people don't have those cards because they lose money on Amazon purchases. But he has an <laughs> online store card. He also has other score, store cards that he saves money with. This is a practice that we have here. Store cards save you. But that practice doesn't exist in the financial world of Nepal. Uh -huh. And I was thinking, I was picking up on a lot of things. And I knew about Gene today that I did not know in the last four years. All of those things had to do with the local context and local culture, especially the sort of good practice of finance, good practice of uh, communication, good practice of education, uh, health. Uh, for you guys, maybe some of those things ring a bell, ring uh, rang a bell. Other things didn't ring anything, right? So this cultural difference is a significant issue, um, and, and and I don't know if it matters in management and uh, engineering, but I, it should because the nature of the bridge that you build in Nepal will be different from the design of the bridge in America. Uh -huh. The cost will matter, the politics will matter, the local material, available material will matter, what people think about the design will matter, the color of the bridge may matter. And at the end of the day, those cultural uh, inferences making is also part of education. Sometimes we tend to think it's all universal, but I think the fact that you didn't mention many, many things means to me that, that you know, we should either start to teach cultural inference making <laughs> or uh, or not take things for granted as universal. Right. I, I think, it, I mean, it's very hard to teach uh, cultural inference making for all cultures around the world. And if when we try to do that, I think we uh, stereotype cultures when we try to do that. So yeah. it's, it's, uh, it's too easy to misinterpret those kind of things. But um, I do think it's important for students to be aware that they are going to be drawing different uh, cultural inferences, even from, say, students in India. Uh, and even if they just learn that once in the course of their engineering degree, they, they may be better prepared for getting a job in India, for example, or they may be better uh, prepared for reading a paper written by somebody in India uh, and understanding the differences between the, the interpretation that that person from India has made that, that they would make in, in Nepal. Um, and I think it only takes one or two examples of that. Uh, otherwise, we just assume that uh, everybody has the same information that we have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, um, what I'm most interested in, of course, is not your drawing inferences about me, but trying to make it memorable for people that facts and inferences are different, that some, some inferences, for example, are very bold, and some are very timid. Um, you, to say that I like travel is probably a timid inference because with all of those cities, it makes, at least it makes it look like, like I, I like travel a lot. Um, but a bolder inference is that I don't care about accommodation. That, that, <laughs> that, that, um, you were taking a risk when you made that inference. Um, and what I like to try to teach students is if they draw timid inferences, that they should try to reach a little harder and take, take more risks. If they tend to draw bold inferences, then I say you should look for more evidence for what you're trying to say. Uh, and, and that way they learn intellectually in, in either direction. Um, what I, let's see, uh, the, the whole chapter that I sent you uh, about facts, inferences, and thesis raises a huge question that Sam and I were talking about earlier this week. And that is, do we teach students to find a position, to take a position, and then to back it up? I think in writing classes, we often do. And I can't say, science classes, I think, vary from one extreme to the other. Laboratories tend to start with facts and then work toward a thesis, um, whereas lecture classes tend to work from a thesis and then find the facts to, to illustrate that thesis. But to my mind, if we want to make intellectual progress, which I think the university should be all about, instead of starting with a thesis and then finding facts to back it up, we should be starting with facts, drawing inferences from those facts, and then a kind of composite of our inferences is our overall thesis. Uh, uh, that's the point that we want to make. And if we, if we learn that way, and if we communicate that way, we will continue to progress in learning rather than... Um, continue to reinforce the values that we already have. Mm -hmm. Does that make any sense to you? Yes. One question, sir. 
for the cultural interference, what things should be considered for the cultural inter interference of any kinds of things or uh, anything? Yes. What would be considered in making a cultural inference? What should you consider? Well, I yeah. think the, the only way to draw a good cultural inference is to know the culture to some extent. You know, and ideally you would visit the culture, right? And you would speak the language, of course. Uh, but if you don't speak the language, at least visiting the culture puts you one step in the right direction. If you can't visit the culture, then you can read about it, you know, on the internet or, or in books or something like that. Uh, you can certainly talk to people that come from other countries who, who visit, visit you. Uh, let's just take the example of, of your view of Americans. Um, how many Americans have you met in your life? A hundred, or twenty-five, <laughs> or ten. I hope it's not just Dr. Hammond. <laughs> <laughs> you don't. You don't. You don't have to answer that question. But but let's see how many. How many? Okay. How, how many? How many Americans have you met? Uh, around fifty. Fifty. Okay. Good. Around fifty. Yeah. Okay. And and you? And probably less than ten. Less than ten. Okay. And, and next, how many Americans I have think, you met? Um, I think not more than five. Not more than five. <laughs> Going down. Okay. <laughs> well, then everybody else can, can just think in their own heads how many they have met. But uh, you, there's also a stereotype of America from the news, right? So have the Americans you met confirmed your stereotype of Americans on the news, or have they gone against your stereotype of Americans from the news? Would anybody will be willing to say anything? Don't worry about offending me about saying anything about Americans. Then <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Yes, in my view, American is not only the white American. There are black American. Right. There are Hispanic American. That's right. So it's very difficult. It's very difficult to portray kind of uh, what Americans uh, really looks like because uh, some of my friends now they become American. Right. There is a <laughs> sin American. Right, that's and right. There, we, I didn't find any kind of uh, changes because when they return home, especially in some kind of festivals, uh -huh. they uh, do similar type of things that they used to do before. Good. And there is certain change for, uh, you know, being adapted to American cultures uh -huh. in language, uh -huh. their habits, and uh, their view about the job, and uh, cultures that have slightly changes but in overall i don't find any differences that's fantastic that is wow. fantastic wow. That's fun, though, said. exactly like you didn't define american in terms of what people traditionally have thought of the european american people that like look like you uh -huh. but he defined american in terms of one the diverse people right and second a set of practices and values exactly um it's very sophisticated, quite sophisticated. Very sophisticated. He's, a, he's a professor of physics uh, management i think uh -huh. <laughs> Oh, yeah. politics. <laughs> um, and I love what you said about Black Americans and Asian Americans and, and Hispanic Americans. Uh, and of course, we are all very, very different. But I'd say most people from other countries think only of white Americans. Yeah, yeah. Right. If you only think about white Americans you have seen, like the tourists in Tamil, uh, they are European Americans, right? So when you meet with them, do you think the what you hear about them and what what you see about them match or is different? Do they challenge your assumptions or do they confirm your assumptions? <laughs> you don't want to say. <clears throat> yes. Yeah. For me, for me, Americans are leaders. They are leaders in education. They are leaders in management. They are leaders in different sectors of our life. Uh -huh. uh, so far, I'm more than 50 Americans in wow. Europe have driven university in Nepal uh -huh. and I have talked to them, I often email them and we, we often chat with them uh -huh. and they are confirmed, they are leaders, uh, they are good at different uh, activities, I mean skills. Interesting. So for Interesting. me, Americans are leaders of the world. Interesting. <laughs> in my opinion, regarding American people and their culture, uh, obviously, they, they, they are diverse type of people in America from the different part of the world. But I have generalized that uh, American people follow the individualistic culture. Yeah. They are very individual. And uh, next one, most of the American people are Christian. They follow the Christian uh, religion. 
This is my generalization uh, yes. about American people. Interesting. That is true. Well, let me let me talk. Yeah, let me talk about both of them. I I, I think um, I would agree with the last speaker very much about the individualism. I think partly because every foreigner who comes to the United States tells me that we are individualistic yes. in comparison to their culture. Again, we're on a spectrum someplace, but I, I'm convinced that we are quite individualistic in the, in the way we approach things. Um, the other question, or the other point that you made is, is interesting to me because if I were gonna make 10, a list of 10 qualities of Americans, I don't think I would have put leaders. Uh, under that, but as soon as you say that, I think um, I, it makes sense. I, I would agree. So, so my cultural sense has been increased by what you say here. Mm. Let me try another possibility on you. Uh, I've traveled a little bit around the world, um, and been in Asia, and been in Africa, been in South America, been in Europe. Um, what? Oh, why did I say that? Uh, oh. And I also grew up during the Vietnam War, and during the Viet, or I was in my 20s in the Vietnam War, and I really came to hate the United States during the Vietnam War. <laughs> so it took me a while to get back to starting to like qualities about the United States. But one thing that I see about us, and I don't know whether it's true, but it's my general impression that Americans tend to be problem solvers. That a lot of other countries, people accept the problems that, that they live with, and I don't say that Americans actually fix the problems, but they assume that they should try to fix the problems. <laughs> Can I say something about that? I don't know if that's true or not. Can I say something about that? Uh -huh. Whenever you read American books, articles, or anything on the internet, one of the patterns you will find is that first they will say, here's a problem, and then they go to say, however, here's, a, here's an assumption, however, here is a problem, therefore. So there's a problem solution uh, mechanism seems to be one of the rhetorical tropes or, uh, or, or methods that is very, very, very common. And I jokingly describe that as the butt move, which is, <laughs> which is, you say, this is what people believe, however, this is what people say, but, because you have to create a new situation where you can say something and contribute something. I don't think that's very common in other uh, scholarly cultures. Um, we tend to apply existing knowledge, we tend to demonstrate existing knowledge, we tend to connect existing knowledge, but we don't tend to say, here is a gap, here's a problem. That gap, if nobody created that gap, you can't create that gap. Sometimes the gap is even false, but people have this tendency, the desire to create a gap and say, we need to solve this in right. order to right. justify your work. Mm -hmm. The justification itself is a gap creating rather than gap identifying sometimes. Mm -hmm. And the word problematize is very problematic for many people around the world, but in the U.S., especially in, in English studies, we problematize things and start solving the problem. <laughs> we try to see what the problem is. There, there's got to be a problem. We can't just accept this as good, right? Uh, which is not necessarily a good way to live. <laughs> <laughs> problematize. But I, think, but I think it is a cultural uh, tendency, yes. Um, Let us look at the time a little bit. We have about 10 minutes, which you uh, just reminding you. Okay. Um, so if if... This is the first webinar that I have ever done, oh, yes. and I'm very honored to be able to, to converse with you today. And I hope, I think we're going to meet some of you uh, in July when we come visit, right? I think all of them. All of you. Good. Uh, and I really look forward to that, and that will be much easier than the webinar in order to communicate with each other. Um, but my hope from, from the exercise that I tried today is, is that you might get some new ideas for your own classes as to how to make students more conscious of the difference between facts and inferences and of the importance of both. Um, but I think depending on what you teach, you know, th there will be a different method that you could have for, for teach, uh, teaching that distinction. Um, and I think that the students uh, will, will really value or get some value from seeing that distinction. I've been teaching for 40 years, and I guess I've been doing this kind of exercise for almost 40 years. And um, I've had so many students come back to me three or four years later and say, you know, after, after they finished university studies, and say, in my job, I, I use that concept uh, all the time, and it helps me make decisions at, at work. Um, so I hope it's useful for you. <laughs> Can you think about an activity in the classroom or the context in which you would take the idea of 
encouraging students to go beyond facts and making inferences and beyond inferences and making a developing thesis in your different disciplines. Can you share some thoughts? <sighs> All the productive silence. Right. Everybody's thinking. Yeah. Hmm. I've been doing this right in talk kind of activity. Uh -huh. It's kind of become a pattern there. The moment I throw a question, take to Oh, that's good. Take time to I don't know if you can write and listen to me at the same time, but I, I think when you're teaching, that if you can get students to write down their thoughts yeah. before anybody answers, it's a hundred times more productive yes. than if you let the, the quickest student in the Talk class re respond right away. Yeah. I can see you all thinking there. Mm -hmm. And regardless of whether we even talk about what you're thinking, that thinking is, is I think, extremely valuable. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm so glad that we were able to pull it back on because I thought it would <laughs> lost the connection. Aha, uh -huh. right. Now, does anybody, has anybody written down something they'd be willing to share? Yeah, I think, sir, the use of interface in the classroom practically to generate the new idea to the students. Right. They, with, with one thing and next thing is to promote the uh, idea of ordinary to the students. Right. Uh -huh. How to promote the idea of the students. It, 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 it means interference promotes or helps to the student to promote their, uh, generate their original idea mm -hmm. regarding about any fact. I Excellent. think these are the two, uh, two, uh, two things are very important for the classroom mm -hmm. in my understanding, uh, sir. I see. Do you use the word inference at all or implication or, or interpretation? I think they all mean pretty, pretty much the same thing. Do you, how do you like? Do you ask the students how do you interpret your data? Rest, I'm sorry. Do you use the word interpretation? Do you use the word inference? Inference, sir. Inference. Whether we give them any pack there in the classroom? How do you use it? Yeah, yeah. In my class, sir. Yeah. Yeah, in my class, there is a basically yeah, we use the, the interpretation of the fact. Basically, this is a trend in our classroom. Uh, we don't use the interface there right now, uh -huh. uh, but basically we uh, interpret the fact. Uh -huh. uh, teacher the fact in the classroom and they uh, note some of the idea of the teacher. This is the tradition of our classroom. But after after this class, then we will apply this uh, trend in our classroom interface about the fact. Right. The, I, the, I like the word inter, uh, inference because it's of its relationship with another term, implication. Mm -hmm. Imply, mm -hmm. the text implies, but you do the work of um, in, in, in making the inference. Uh, and, and while we use the word interpretation also sometimes, but I think it's more used in literature. The word inference can be used in any, any discipline. I, I like the openness of that word. Mm -hmm. When I was a young teacher, I don't think anybody used the word inference. Uh, they used implication, they used interpretation, but it was very uncommon to use the word inference. I think it has grown gradually over the 40 years of my career. Um, and I guess I hope it, it continues to grow because uh, I think it's so, so useful and so universal, as Sam said. Um, it applies to every field that I'm aware of. Uh, and it makes sense to use the term in every field uh, that I'm aware of. What other? Uh, yes. Uh, I think this lesson is very useful for teaching thesis writing. Thesis writing. Yes. Thesis writing. This is writing. Uh -huh. uh, we ask the students to develop a writer thesis, and in order to develop their thesis, we ask them to call it data, facts. That means factual data or facts. Right. And on the basis of fact or data, they. Uh, interfere they uh, draw some interference and support their thesis exactly uh, and this is useful and 
uh, teaching thesis writing. Right. And we can use the same uh, idea in our classroom writing also. Uh -huh. we, we can draw a statement of. I was just going to ask, when your students write, do they write their thesis statement before they start writing at the beginning, or do you encourage them to revise their thesis as they go along? Uh, so some students, they first develop their thesis statement, and in order to develop that thesis statement, they collect some data. Right. Uh, and uh, on the basis of that data, they draw some inferences and support their thesis statement. And sometimes other students in other types of research, for example, uh, experimental design or other, uh, they can use the next one. With the reverse order, yes. Yeah, yeah. and it, it, does, it? it does differ depending on the project <coughs> that you're doing. That, that you're doing. Um, but I think it helps students if they realize that it's not always thesis, then inferences or parts, parts of their thesis, and then uh, data. But it's often data, and then the inferences, and then the thesis. And then by the time they finish the paper, then their thesis should be in line with the data that they have come up with, right? Um, I, th I think that's more intellectually respectable and more, you know, it prepares students better for the work world. Um, and it helps us with the advancement of knowledge, I think. This also is connected to what we have been talking about in the past few weeks. But because the months we have been saying that um, the shift from the traditional knowledge demonstration model examination model to the semester system is not a system not simply a switch from one part of the year one part year to a two part year but instead making the switch from students um, you know taking exam demonstrating knowledge to uh, creating new meaning uh, developing their own research agenda finding problems and solving becoming experts and presenting. Uh, and I think the, the workshop that uh, Professor Hammond has done today is absolutely a, a solid, concrete activity to take into the classroom and show them the difference between the traditional education and modern education, where we say, in the traditional education, it was enough for you to show me that you know the facts. In the modern education, I want you to make the inference, because you are the new knowledge creators, that you are the knowledge sort of generators, right? And then. If you take one step further, the word thesis takes makes it a little more easier to explain what it, in terms of writing, because thesis is an overarching framing sentence, inference. Um, and that one sentence allows you to put everything into that container. But inferences are small theses, I think. Which is <laughs> right, it. yes, yes. So that you can, without having the, you know, being discouraged by the need to create a large thesis, you're creating little moves and then many little moves will uh, help you to generate larger moves. And then finally, actually the thesis, as Jim was suggesting, can be put after you finish making all of those inferences as a final insight, but you can always put it in the front, even if you come to the thesis at the end of your writing process. So this is good for explaining the writing process. This is good for comparing the traditional education with modern education. This is good for encouraging the students to value their own voices. And this is also good for making students aware of the uh, weaknesses, aware of cultural, cultural context, aware of the difference of interpretation, aware of the possible mistake that they will make, but it's okay. We're always trying to make inference, and inference is a tool for learning and teaching. Now, I would like to underline the fact that we shouldn't expect inferences to be perfect or, or uh, always uh, impressive or, or anything, that we have to do them and practice them often. And some will be just of ordinary value, some will be actual mistakes, but many will be uh, valuable or extremely valuable. Uh, but, but in order to do, to, to make those extremely valuable inferences, we have to practice making inferences regularly and recognize that that's what we're doing. I think that's the important thing. I think students often, and people in general, they draw inferences all the time without recognizing that they're doing that. They, yeah. they think it's a fact. Yeah. Indeed. Uh -huh. There's an engineer and there's a scientist in the room. We want to hear how you do that in your field. What are the ways in which you engage students in making inferences? The engineer and scientist. Did it freeze? It might have frozen, yeah. Uh -huh. It'll come back. <laughs> it happens sometimes. Uh -huh. 
What is this called? Google Hangout. Google Hangout. Uh -huh. How many minutes do we have? Five or less? Five, yeah. That's the way I'm hearing you. I can start an alternative channel to find out what's happening. Hmm. It's pretty good. I mean, it's it good. is. It really worked very well. Yeah, it's very productive so far. So let's see. Falling on Viber. Yeah, that's all free. This is all free. Even for ah. oh, it yeah, dropped us out. It dropped oh. us out. So. Okay, so I'm going to stop this. It, uh, we lost connection with our colleagues on the other side. Um, we are basically done almost. If we get a chance, we will wrap up and say thanks.